the next 40, well, 50 minutes, roughly, I think, um, will be a whistle-stop tour through my take on the issues of climate change. And uh, that the, uh, Richard laid out this sort of the formal title, but the sort of subtitle that is from delusion um, to action on climate change. This won't, particularly to start off with, it'll be a fairly uh, depressing talk to some of you, perhaps, but it, it does pick up towards the end, so <laughs> it's not quite a Hollywood ending, but, <laughs> but it's something a bit better. But, um, I'm going to start off with a quote that was taken out of a paper that I um, wrote with a colleague of mine quite a few years ago now, which we thought would be removed during the review process, but it was kept in. Real hope, if it is to arise at all, will do so from a, fair, from a bare assessment of the scale of the challenge that we now face. And I don't think we do... Uh, honestly face the challenge at all. I think across the board, academics, the NGOs, the policymakers, the business community, the journalists, we deliberately delude ourselves, and eventually we've swallowed that as well, and we delude other people around us. So I think we're actually almost all in some sort of fairly deep-seated collective delusion, and it's quite hard to unpick that and reveal what's underneath it. But until we do, I don't think we can really respond genuinely to the scale of the challenges that we face. And I'll try and outline why I come to that conclusion during this talk. I'm going to start off with the Paris Agreement, which hopefully you're all reasonably familiar with. Um, and it commits us, I'll whip through these quite quickly so you'll know this, to take action, and that's quite important, to take action. To hold the temperatures, average temperature below 2 degrees centigrade, and ideally aim for 1.5. And the 1.5 was quite a shock in Paris, because um, you know, most of us thought it was a real struggle to hold the 2 degrees centigrade, and then 1.5 emerged. And that was actually driven very much by some of the poorer parts of the world that looked at the impacts associated with 2 degrees centigrade and said that's you know, disastrous for us. And at 1.5, the impacts are noticeably uh, less damaging, but still, um, still problematic for many parts of the world. It's also worth bearing in mind that a cold day in Newcastle at 2 degrees centigrade is something like 6 degrees at the poles. It's a fundamental change in our climate system occurring almost overnight. We've seen 1 degree temperature rise over the last 10,000 years of modern human time. We've had about 2 degrees occurring virtually in the, in the blink of an eye. So ecosystems and probably human systems are really going to struggle to deal with that. We also promised to, do, uh, to undertake our action in accordance with the best science and on the basis of equity. And I think it's fair to say that no country in the world has taken equity seriously, either between countries, which are in poorer countries, or indeed within countries. So I think we've just fundamentally failed, and deliberately so, on e equity. So I'm going to touch very briefly, this is not my area at all, on impacts. Um, and then go on to mitigation on reducing our emissions, which is the, the work that I do most of the time. So I would argue, to start off with, that we should acknowledge that the Paris framing is itself unjust. That if these people suffering in parts of the world um, with weather events that are exacerbated by climate change, or not caused by them, but exacerbated by them, by, exacerbated by them whether it's Haiyan, whether it's in Mozambique this year, or whether it's in Sandy, or um, you know, other various events, the climate change... Um, the actual energy we've put in the system so far is, ex uh, is already exacerbating the severity of some of, these, some of these issues. We already know that we're damaging a lot of the major ecosystems around the planet. Um, we, can, we can witness that now, and we know that as the temperatures continue to rise, and they will do in the short to medium term, that that's going to get much worse. We also are fully aware that what we've done so far is going to have quite serious impacts on our children's prospects, um, either directly from climate change or indirectly from the impacts of climate change on other people and how that plays out in a globalised world. So let's be absolutely clear that currently as we are, many people are already suffering, many people are already dying from climate change, and that's going to get much worse as we go from 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. Now these people won't typically be in the North East or the UK, they're going to be in southern parts of the world typically, not always. They'll typically be poor, they'll often be non-white, and they'll be a long way from here and very low emitters. And we have known that for 30 years, and we have not acted. We've carried on knowing that. And of course, we are affecting the future generations of all species um, out for the next, well, probably could be the next uh, many centuries, we don't know. So we're now going to focus on mitigation, saying that we, you know, we, we've already seen these impacts, and what we want to try and do is stop the impacts getting much worse. So let's think about what are we doing to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. And this talk is primarily focused on energy, with full recognition that agriculture and the food industry is hugely important as well. Probably 20% or so of the warming is associated with that with that um, that realm. It's not the area I work on. I have colleagues that, that work on those those issues. Um, there are things we can do about uh, emissions from agriculture, particularly methane and N2O, but we cannot eliminate them. And we do need to eliminate all carbon emissions from energy, partly because we cannot eliminate all of the emissions from agriculture. So let's start with just how badly we are failing on this. 
And let's think of the UK, which is a self-avowed climate progressive nation. Um, and I was in Norway recently saying, making the same comment there really, on this. Here, this is the sort of things I used to design and build actually many years ago. The Clare Ridge Phase 2 platform, first oil in November 2018. I think it's 640 um, million barrels expected out of this, and emissions a quarter of a billion tonnes of CO2. So in a, in a time of climate emergency, when we're announcing climate emergencies, we're celebrating this sort of thing. November 2018, it wasn't a long time ago, quarter of a billion tonnes of CO2. So quite a few of us here would be dead and that thing still producing carbon dioxide. That'd be 30, 40 years away. Then we've got the Glengorn gas discovery, announced January 2019, held by the Scottish National Party, who have a lot of time for many things, but not on this. I think it's wonderful. The UK government thinks it's wonderful. Another 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. And you can look at the um, recent discovery in Hull this year, just in the summer, 2019. Another you know, wonderful on-site discovery of gas. Another 30 million tonnes of CO2. Add to that, you've got this man, thankfully, no longer in this position. Um, <laughs> And remember, he was supported in this by most of the MPs in the House of Commons on all sides. The expansion of Heathrow. And if you actually look at the Committee on Climate Change's estimates of what they think, what, they, what they're saying the aviation industry must do in terms of you know, holding and controlling its emissions to some extent, when we work out the CCC's estimates of aviation emissions out to the, out to the future, it represents about 40% of what we would estimate, myself and some of my colleagues, as being the UK's fair contribution to the Paris Agreement. 40% for one sector that works primarily for a small privileged few in our society. You know, frequent flyers are the ones that drive aviation, not the majority. Most people fly either not at all or only occasionally, even in wealthy countries. So it's driven primarily by a relatively small, small cohort of society. And yet what we've seen here is pretty much silence from many in the academic community, particularly the more senior they are. The more senior and the more male, the more silence you've heard. And, <laughs> or even worse, acquiescence. I don't know, actually, I don't know which one's worse, actually. Um, I, mean, I think that it's, it's Thomas More's maxim that silence you know, leads to consent. So we've had, had really no, dis, no disagreement, or at least vociferous disagreement from the academic community on North Sea oil and gas, or airport expansion, or indeed shale gas for that matter. There have been some exceptions to this, but by and large, the academic community <coughs> has sat back and allowed this to carry on and not held government to account. And this all, of course, is completely and utterly incompatible with our Paris Agreement. So we should be using our maths and our science. So we are being activists by being quiet. Now, so most academics in this realm are activists simply by staying silent about these issues. So is the UK, uh, isn't the UK showing leadership? Isn't this what we normally hear with how well the UK is doing on climate change? I heard this at the, uh, at the event last year in, um, uh, where were we, I can't remember, it was, it was born a couple of years ago, it was in Katowice in Poland last year. How well the UK is doing. Committee on Climate Change report 2017, emissions were 42% below 1990, and provisional figures for 2018 are 44%. That sounds really quite promising. That's, that's good news. And many academics wrote, said how wonderful this was when this net zero report came out. Remember, net zero, net is Latin for pass the buck on to your children. So remember what that means. <laughs> um, so look at UK PLC. Let's include aviation shipping because they're not the responsibility of God or some other entity. They're the responsibility of the country that are using those. Remember, no country really takes those into account. So let's include aviation shipping. Let's include imports and exports. My laptop here, partly made in, or quite a lot of it made in China. We blame the Chinese for the high emissions, but I'm never really going to use them over here. So we have to take that into account as well. And what you see is a very different story. The UK has had about 10% fall in emissions since 1990, and most of that was driven by the banking crisis and the closure of some coal stations because of their sulfur emissions, not because of their coal emissions, not because of their CO2 emissions. That's about 0.4% every single year. Norway's up about 40%, Ireland's up about 25%, Belgium's up about 15%. So you look across a lot of European countries and you see no real reduction in emissions. Sweden, Denmark, France all claim to be climate progressive countries, no reduction in emissions since 1990. So let's not pretend that it's all about the poor parts of the world, it's also about the wealthy parts of the world that are doing very little about climate change. So what does the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the big sort of UN body that plates together all the science here on every sort of five years or so. What does that tell us about the Paris Agreement? What can we learn from the science about what we need to do? And I'm going to, um, quite unfairly, summarise the whole of the IPCC's sort of science basis in this one sentence. Um, it's carbon budgets that matter. 
uh, not long-term targets. So what we do by 2050 in isolation is pretty irrelevant. Even what we do by 2030 is pretty irrelevant. In fact, the later we leave climate change mitigation doing anything about it, the more important it becomes the, the next few years. And right now, what we do in the next year, two, three, four, five, is what really matters in terms of climate change. So it's carbon budgets that matter. And when we play that out within the science, what we see from this, that this, there are different interpretations of this, but you, and you can ask me about this in questions if you want, but our, our best interpretation of the Paris Agreement from the language that's there is that for 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, and I can, it's about a, a likely chance of 2 degrees centigrade and an unlikely chance of 1.5, we have something like 650 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide we can emit. That's the total amount of carbon dioxide we can emit from now out to almost forever, certainly for 100 to 200 years. And if we emit no more than that, then hopefully the temperature will stay below 2 degrees centigrade of warming. Hopefully, starting from 2020. That probably means nothing to most of you. But that's a bit more helpful then. But from energy, we emitted about 37 billion tonnes last year. So those of you with a moderately arithmetic mind can totally work out that's about 18 years. So 18 years of current emissions, and we've, and we've <coughs> completely used up our carbon budget for the Paris Agreement, 18 years. And remember, emissions are not coming down. I think we're going to come back to that in a minute. So where do we go to from here? Once we know this, once we realise that's the scale of the challenge that we're starting to face, where should we go to? Well, I think we have to start off with a bit of humility, uh, particularly for my generation. And, and looking at you here, probably one or two of your generations as well. <laughs> this is the first IPCC report in 1990, 29 years ago. Some of, there's a few people here. Some of you here, your parents hadn't met when this report came out. <laughs> so I think your parents, your grandparents, your lecturers, all knew about this for 30 years. Just remember what we've known for 30 years. And yet, 19, 2018 emissions were 67% higher than they were in 1990. So people of my generation that no hair, dyed hair, or, or uh, grey hair, have chosen to actively fail on climate change, either by doing nothing or actually trying to make emissions get higher by by pursuing more oil and gas and driving bigger cars. <coughs> and even in 2018, emissions went up by 1.6% as they did the year before. So emissions are still going up, despite the fact we're calling climate emergencies, despite the fact we've had 30 years of evidence on this. You know, we're, we're, we've no doubt that climate change is a, is a huge issue, mostly closely linked to the fossil fuel industry. So you know, we don't have any doubt about that, and we have a pretty good handle on what we need to do. We're still choosing to do nothing. 29 years of abject failure at a collective level. That doesn't mean to say some people haven't tried, but let's be honest about it, collectively we have failed. And when you realise that, when you're honest and sit down and reflect on that, you then start to think, well, what do we need to do to succeed? But if we keep pretending that we're doing quite well, you know, telling people, well, we've got 44% reduction in our emissions in the UK, nonsense like that, then we're going to carry on with this delusion, and it's become impossible to respond to the Paris Agreement. And it's getting near that now. So, why have we done this? Well, what's our approach so far. We've had a whole suite of what I call technocratic fraud. We've first we've had partial accounting. We haven't thought about aviation and shipping um, as we expand those particular sectors. We've had offsetting. If you're trying to lose weight and you ask someone else to cut back on the chocolate, it's not going to work. <laughs> um, and yet that's what we've done here, sort of paying for indulgences, that sort of thing. So, uh, and actually, uh, whilst I think some of, the, some of the schemes might be worthwhile in themselves, I think offsetting is worse than doing nothing from a climate perspective. And that's a different argument. I can have you discuss that with you later if you want to. We've got a clean development mechanism. As soon as you give a nice sort of government acronym to something, it sounds like it's legitimate. So now we've got CDM. That sounds good, reliable. It's just offsetting done by the countries, by rich countries. So it's just state-sanctioned offsetting. Rather than we make the reductions, we pay the Ghanaians or the Chinese to make the reductions for us. Whilst we lock in ongoing fossil fuel behaviours, institutions and infrastructures. Then we have afforestation, which has been used already in Sweden to say we're going to expand our land airport in Stockholm by planting a few more trees in the north of Sweden. That's the argument the government's already making on that. And then when all this lot comes collapsing down, because of course it has done so far, we're going to rely, not we, sorry, our children and our children's children are going to have to develop negative emission technologies, which I'll come back to later, to suck hundreds of billions of tonnes of CO2 from the air. Um, and that's, that's embedded in virtually every single main scenario that advises governments around the world there, and the IPCC as well. It's, it's everywhere. Um, and when that one comes and doesn't work, and actually a lot of models are doing that, don't think it will work at the scale of the models, we're going to rely on geoengineering. And you already get economists and engineers getting together on this. You know, firing <laughs> rockets in the stratosphere to spread out sulfate particles, to reflect sunlight in space. And then slowly those sulfate particles migrate out to the pole, and we have to send another rocket up into the stratosphere. What we haven't done in 29 years is try to reduce our CO2. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a shameful, it's a, it's a 
a shameful litany of fraud that we have collectively overseen this for 30 years, and we are still doing the same thing today. And that includes things like the UNFCCC and the IPCC. A lot of their meetings, they say, are zero carbon, because they just offset it. So we are part of that process. What we've got is failure with large. At every single level, we have failed in, in any collective sense. So that's quite depressing. So I've got a bit of Leonard Cohen, always known for <laughs> upbeat music. <laughs> One of my favourite poets and, <laughs> um, <laughs> and singers as well. And looking, looking at you here, quite a few of you here, some of you will have heard of Leonard Cohen. Quite a few when I time when I speak to my students, they look at me, who oh, is this Leonard Cohen man? <laughs> um, so anyway, so I'm going to take um, a lyric now up here from a uh, song anthem, which you've probably seen before because it's been used on, I think, for a few other things as well. It's a wonderful lyric, like a lot of his lyrics. I mean, the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering, there's a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. And um, I think there's some, it's a useful sort of framing, at least I'm going to try and hope it's a useful framing, for the rest of the talk. So ring the bells that still can ring. You know, there are plenty of things that we know what to do. We're not waiting for science or engineering to solve these problems for us. We've been sat there with all of the solutions at our fingertips, or as many of them, for, for several decades. Passive house standards. We've been building passive houses for years, but they're only just you know, here and there. And we're not putting them, not all our houses, they're just little pilot schemes or experiments. But we know how to do that. Why, are, why is it in 2019 that all of our houses aren't up to some sort of passive house standard? And our buildings aren't like that. Why have we got a maximum carbon dioxide emissions on cars? Why is it the SUVs? And the SUVs are absolutely rocketing around the globe now, including the UK and in Sweden. Now, you wouldn't be, they wouldn't be rocking if you had a maximum CO2 per kilometre standard on it, so no more than 100 grams. They wouldn't be doing that. But we're, you know, they're completely dwarfing electrical car sales. So we talk about electric cars, but we're actually buying and selling more than SUVs. I think 40% of the vehicles sold last year were SUVs in the UK. Less meat and dairy, we know how to do that. I'm not saying to become vegetarian or vegan, but we certainly know how to cut back on our meat, particularly red meats, any animal with two stomachs, ruminants, always a problem. So better off eating pigs and chickens if you want to stay with meat than you are eating red meat, at least cut back on the red meat. No airport expansion, we know about that. We have to fit our existing buildings, which are of appalling quality in the UK. I was sort of saying in Sweden that a, a, a Swedish tent is about as efficient as a British building. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's plenty, plenty of things we can do. And there's a whole lot more. So on to, there, are, there are many bells that we can ring. We're not waiting for, um, for new technology. The problem is we love excuses to carry on business as usual. <coughs> and now the next line, forget your perfect offering. We're really good. You need... Um, elderly white men in universities are really good at coming up with all sorts of perfect offerings. And here's one. The Stern um, report in 2006, and I, actually I think he was very brave in taking on his own profession as an economist, Nick Stern, in terms of what's called discounting, how you value the future. So that I think was really important in this report, but otherwise it was appalling. Um, you look at the numbers in it, economists should never use numbers other than page numbers. Um, <laughs> You look, at the, you look at the numbers in this report, um, and he had, he had emission growth between two, this came out in 2006, he had emission growth between 2000 and 2006 at 0.92% per annum, 0.92% on average between 2000 and 2006, the real data was 2.4%, the empirical data that was available when he was writing the report was 2.4%, and if any, any of you here are any good at numbers will know that you know, 0.92 is like this, 0.24 is like that, and when you think it's a cumulative problem, you draw the rest of the curve, what you get is a completely different conclusion to the one he drew here. But the one he drew here fitted with business as usual. It's a small percentage of GDP you have to spend to overcome climate change. And everyone wants to hear that message, so we back, we back engineer our analysis to make sure that we can always say we can solve climate change within the existing paradigm. So we didn't even use the empirical data. But of course you heard a, a, a roar of academics who read this and thought, that's completely wrong, the empirical data is not like that. Didn't hear a soul. Academics stay quiet yet again. And we have the mitigation reports in the IPCC. The IPCC does some really fantastic work. Working group one is on the science, working group two is pretty much on the impact issues, and working group three shouldn't be there. Um, and working group three is the one that works on mitigation, on reducing our emissions. And reducing emissions is innately a political issue. It cannot be any other than a political issue. So the idea we have some sort of, um, some sort of almost like neutral assessment of what we have to do about it, I think is misleading. And it's not done when well, I am critical of what goes into this report, but I think actually, if, if I was writing the report, it also shouldn't be there. That report shouldn't be there because I think it's just innately too political an issue. So I would say we should take that one out. And it has been really misleading, and I'll come back to that later. 
We now have more economists getting together again with Nick Stern, showing how you can just basically have a green business as usual and still solve climate change. And then we've got the net zero report um, from the Committee on Climate Change. And I should add that I have a huge amount of time and respect for the Secretariat and indeed the new CEO, or the newest CEO now, Chris Stark, of the Committee on Climate Change. Um, but I'm very critical, and I have been from the outset, of the really excellent academics they have who are, who are the commissioners for the Committee on Climate Change. So they have a series of very well-known academics. And I think by and large, almost without exception, and I'm saying this because I've spoken to them about it as well, I think they have pretty much been co-opted when they've gone in. They tend to take a politic, put on a political hat rather than remain scientifically robust. And I think that's happened right from the beginning. Others may disagree with me, Chris, Chris Stark, disagrees with me on this, but I think the Secretariat are excellent, but they've been let down by a group of commissioners who, who for very good, well-meaning reasons, have continued to try and tread a uh, politically convenient line. And it's not their job as scientists, in my view. It's never the job of scientists to do that. I think the, the, the report we have now, it smacks of colonialism. And I had a discussion with Chris about this, because he finds that really hard when I say this. But I think it's true. I have I reflected whether I should change that view. It, in this, they are assuming the UK gets a really large carbon budget, which I'll come back to later. About, I would say, two to three times bigger than it should be for the UK. So not only did we steal the slaves of the continent of Africa, then we stole their minerals. We're now seeing their carbon budget. So we have, we're just carrying on with the same sort of approach that we've had historically. So much larger amount of emissions allocated to the UK. And then when we're in the UK, we've said, actually, and we're not going to do anything about it. Our generation aren't. We're going to carry on with doing what we do now, and we're going to pass it on to our children. So we've also got buck passing within, the, within this report. And what it does, of course, at the end, I mean, it's, it's more challenging than these other ones out here, but it's basically greenwashing business as usual. It's pushed it a bit harder than the other ones, but it's still saying you can do everything within the current framework. And yet, if you play out the maths, as I'm going to try and do now, you, it looks a completely different story to that. And yet, academics stay, have stayed quiet about that pretty much now, um, since the report came out a year or so ago, or a year ago, well, yeah, around about a year. So, how loud must the Paris bell ring? I should hasten to add, this is my, oh, I very sadly just died a couple of months ago, but it's my uncle's place up here on the Isle of Arran, really beautiful on the west coast. That's where I'm, where I'm going to be when climate change really hits. <laughs> um, so, let's look at this sort of quantitatively. This is the missions historically, and before Paris, we were heading somewhere up, up here. We don't know exactly where it was, and we shouldn't overplay the precision in the science, but it was something like a four to six degrees centigrade of warming. That's where we were sort of heading with the way the emissions were going. Whether they would have carried on like that, who knows, but that's roughly the level of warming. And that's a completely different planet from the one in which we live. Um, with Paris, uh, the countries of the world, virtually every country submitted its pledge to what it thought was the maximum that it could deliver on reducing emissions. And you add all the pledges together, and what you get is three to four degrees centigrade of warming, which is still a very different place from today. So it's still nothing like the world that we would recognise, occurring virtually overnight. But of course, in the, in the Paris Agreement, we promised to try and aim to 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, and that plays out a budget of around about 650 billion tonnes, as I said before. Now, it could be a bit more than that, it could be a bit less, and I'll come back to that a bit later. But it looks more like this. So not like that, not like this, but like that. Completely different. Zero emissions by about 2050. From, this is from energy. Zero emissions by 2050. But we also have to remember that we have promised to do this on the basis of equity. And that means the wealthy parts of the world have to lead by example. And, and if you read the language in the IPCC, in the Paris Agreement, and indeed some of the other reports as well, you'll notice that in that language, it's sort of it's really saying that the wealthy parts of the world should reach a peak and then reduce their emissions to zero well ahead of the poor parts of the world. And yet we, we never take that into account, nor did the net zero report in the UK. No one takes that to account seriously. So what we saw at Paris and what we see repeatedly is a sort of lot of euphoria, by usually by very high emitting people, um, <laughs> about what we can do about climate change. And we can just we can modify the technologies, we can get the oil companies on board, we have a bit of carbon capture and storage, and hey presto, we carry on with the same sort of system we've got today, which may have worked if we started in 1990, but 30 years of failure means that that won't work anymore, but we still pretend it will. So how has it been muffled? Well, it's been muffled, I think, the whole story has been muffled by a particular group of modelers. And I'm not, I actually am going to blame them on this particular group of modelers, but I'm also blaming the rest of the academic community um, for not calling them out more, more often. And they are starting to now, I think. But also, many of us have wanted to hear the outcome from these modelers. And these are the, what are called, integrated assessment modelers. They're groups of, model, there's a handful of these groups around the world usually in the wealthier, wealthier countries. They've got these huge modelling um, expertise, 
and it brings together the basics of the climate science, so nothing really detailed. So they're not climate models, but they have a, a simple climate model in them. They've got a lot of economists in them, and they're pretty much all standard near classical economists, so there's not a breadth of economics thinking, there's a particular form of economics. Um, and then they have people who look at things like transitions theory, or looking historically, how have we moved between technology, um, technologies in the past from the steam engine to the, to the, to the um, jet engine and that sort of thing. So they, they look at those things and then they play out um, what they think would be the optimised route at a global level to respond to climate change. And they have um, carbon budgets, or they, they imply carbon budgets that are much larger than comes out of the science, and therefore much less challenging mitigation, and therefore much more politically appealing. So when you play out, and it, I mean, they produce lots of scenarios, and these scenarios are dominant in working group three, um, and they all look they all look very similar. Ninety five percent of them look very very similar. If you play them out, the emissions look more like that. So that's about the median number of emissions from the uh, scenarios submitted to the IPCC by these integrated assessment modellers. Now imagine you're a policymaker. Imagine you're the vice chancellor of the university. Or imagine you're, you're the vice people like us when we go on holiday. Which line do you prefer, the blue one or the red one? We always like the red one because that's business as usual or something, something like it anyway. That's how children solve the problem later on. The blue one is really difficult for us. And remember that blue one is at a, a global level. Nationally, ours will be tighter, which I'll come back to in a minute. So what we see is that post-2020, the IPCC science broadly gives us around about 650 billion tonnes of CO2 to play with. Um, and the modelers give us typically about 1,500 billion tonnes. You say, well, how can that be the case in the same sort of science? It's all the same science, all the same main climate models behind it all. Um, so there's a question there, mate, oh, how do you make sense of that? <laughs> it's my second favourite climate change film. By, um, it's called Dr. Strangelove, which is all about particular types of men and technology. Um, I think these models are uh, dominated by Dr. Strange. Um, there's also a wonderful film by Naomi, uh, based on a book called Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Reskies and uh, Eric Conway. The film is excellent and the book is really good as well. Both are worth looking at. But I, I think, although that wasn't about climate change, I think it really captures the allure of uh, speculative technologies in the future. And what we are planning is, a, a bit, it sounds bizarre to say this, but I think it's honestly true. We are planning to pull rabbits out of hats. These things don't exist, these technologies, not in any scale. So we're conjuring up negative emission technologies, and a conjure is the right word. That's not to say we haven't got a few very, very small pilot schemes. And there were some ideas, and a few professors are probably more postdocs imaginations. Professors don't have much imagination. But I mean, at my age, normally you've lost it, imagination. It's, it's postdocs with PhDs that have it. Um, and these technologies, in the future, are going to suck out hundreds of billions of tonnes of CO2 in the atmosphere. Hundreds of billions of tonnes, not just a few tonnes. And if you play it out, this is again the median value, this is actually taken from a paper in science that I wrote with um, Glenn Peters in, in Norway, um, this, this graph. It goes on across the century, notice when it starts. So people like me, of course, will either be tired or um, in Tuscany or pushing up the daisies by the time we assume that the negative emissions to start. So that's why we like them. We can carry on doing the things that you know, I'm doing, and then we can pass the buck on to the next generation. And it goes on, oh, a mistake there. It goes on to the next generation. So not only have today's children got to solve this problem, but our, their children as well are going to have to deal with this problem, because we cannot be bothered to stay over here with the blue curve. So it's a real generational buck passing. And one way of thinking about that is that currently we emit there or there about 40 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, of which about half of it is absorbed through sort of natural processes, through the absorption into the oceans and absorptions into the plants on, the, on, um, on Earth. So about 20 billion tonnes there or thereabouts is absorbed by the oceans and plants, you know, thankfully. And the other 20 billion tonnes pretty much remains in the atmosphere and just builds up um, and lasts for a long time, 20% of it or so, maybe there for 10,000 years. And what we're assuming about these technologies that don't exist across virtually every single model run on this, is that we're going to have some sort of technology that's about half to roughly the same size as our own planet, sucking the CO2 out of the air. Now, now that would be fine if we had one in 20 scenarios that were like that. But if you have 19 out of 20 scenarios that are like that, that becomes a systemic institutional bias. And that is what we have in climate change. And it, it what completely dominates the whole discourse of that mitigation, is we have to assume these technologies work in the future, or we have to ask really difficult political questions, and we've run scared of that for years. So we're, we're prepared to question physics, because we're not prepared to question ephemeral economics. So without this sort of generational buck passing, 
I'm not saying we shouldn't research these technologies. We should do. We should really research them with a really good, sort of well-funded program. But to assume they work is a moral hazard, and we should not be assuming they work. So research them, but reduce emissions as if they do not work would be the, would be the appropriate response. So without them, what would the UK's fair contribution to Paris start to look like? And you start to realise why we stick like this. Um, so it's all about pies, or as I would call, stotties, um, my time at South Shields. Um, so if we want to limit the warming to uh, 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, we've got a pie or a tart or whatever you want to call it. Um, and we know roughly its size, it could be a bit bigger, it could be a bit smaller. Um, my best guess, and some of you here who work on climate change will probably know this as, as well, if not much better than I do, I think the, the pie is going to get smaller. I think it'll get smaller because I think we're going to get some additional feedbacks in there, which will make the situation worse. So I think the budgets that we have are probably quite optimistic. In the latest report, the budgets for 1.5 degrees centigrade are about uh, two and a half times bigger than they were in the last report. And if for 2 degrees centigrade, they're about 60% bigger. And I think that's probably going to be reversed again in the next report. But we don't know. So for now, let's just stick with what the report that came out from the IPCC last year, SR 1.5, that sort of budget range, which is about 650 billion tonnes for energy. <coughs> we have to split that amongst every country in the world, and you start to think, ah, oh, that's going to be quite problematic. Um, yeah, because everyone's going to want a larger slice than they should really have. So when I said before about Britain being quite colonialist, you know, pretty much every other country is as well. But we've got, we have a, a legacy, a history of being very colonial. Um, some of the others are newer to it. Uh, <laughs> So when you ask them to put, it, you know, put all their slices together, it comes to three to four centigrade of, um, of warming. So that's not going to work. So we have to find some other way to do this. And we've shied away from that, I think, in all the international negotiations. And there's no neat way out of this. This is a rationing issue at a global level, and it's a rational issue at a national level. So we've got to look at this. How do you ration it out? There are some good examples. If you, don't, you shouldn't really negotiate for your own country. If, if, um, if the US negotiated for Nigeria, Nigeria negotiated for the UK, the UK negotiated for China, and China negotiated for the rest of the EU, if we're not in it, or if we are it, who knows, um, then actually you'd probably get a much fairer distribution of the cake. But instead, everyone goes out there, everyone's negotiator goes out there, and just before they leave, they're sort of told by their country, get as much as you can, and it all fails. So we have to be more mature about this, and, as, and the evidence suggests so far that we are not prepared to be mature about this, we're prepared to see the temperatures keep going up. So what we've done is, um, in a paper that's uh, hopefully going to be out in two months, um, we've tried to look in some detail as to what size the budget would look like for the wealthier nations. Um, this, is not, this is not to scale, it's just to find a pie with a slice out of it. In fact, it might be about to scale, actually. <laughs> it wasn't designed to be to scale. And um, I'm just using the OECD here as a proxy for the wealthier parts of the world. There's a, there's a lot more work into which countries are in that and which aren't behind the scenes. But, so we've looked at that, and, we've, and the pie could be a certain... How do you divide it? Divide the population on the size of your current emissions, the size of your historical emissions, the size of your economy, your capacity to change. Um, there's a whole set of things you can look at. And we've looked at these different um, uh, allocation or apportionment regimes, and we've come up with a range that this pie could look like. So it could be a bit bigger, it could be a bit smaller. Um, but given that co overall carbon budget is very tight, there isn't actually a lot to play with. That's what's really interesting, well, and quite disturbing. There isn't a lot of scope for flexibility in any of this. And then we've asked... How much should, should the old blighty get? Um, so what size, should, what size of that slice should then be allocated to the UK? And our estimates are about 3 to 3.8 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide from 2020, January the 1st, 2020 onwards. So we've got a couple of months, or a month and a bit there to have some fun under this, <laughs> knuckling down to this. Um, you know, and there's a reasonable range to this. And you think, well, can we be that precise? Well, you know. We can't, it can't be much different to that, unless other countries are going to forgo a lot, because, they, because we're so tight on the budget now. Remember, 18 years at a global level. So if you play that out for the UK, because that probably doesn't mean too much to most of you, that's about nine years of current emissions. Now, that does include aviation and shipping, which are, aviation is about 10% in the UK and about 15% in Sweden and growing, um, but it doesn't include imports and exports. So this is territorial emissions only. But about nine years of current emissions means we've actually swamped that whole budget. That's the 3.8 end. Um, oh, what's that picture again? Um, tra translating that now into mitigation rates, which is quite important for, say, universities or for councils or for, um, for policymakers more generally, how rapidly do we need to reduce our emissions to stay within that? Well, it's about 10 to 13% reduction rates for someone like the UK, slightly higher, I think it was, for Sweden, but it depends exactly how you, again, how you, how you divide these things up. But somewhere well above 10% every single year, starting almost immediately. I remember it's a cumulative issue, it's a carbon budget issue. So every year you fail 
it gets much higher the next year. If it just be 5% next year, then the year after that isn't 10% again. The year after that is much higher again. So in the next, just to give a feel for this, between now and the end of 2022, so that's three years, we need something like a 30% reduction in our emissions. By the end of, 20, by the end of um, 2030, we need something like a 70% reduction in our emissions. And when we before, I said it's a 2050 at the global level, for the wealthy parts of the world, it's 2035 to 2040, we have to be zero carbon. And just to be clear about that, is that zero carbon for aviation, shipping, cars, industry, domestic heating, industrial heating, process heating, everything. Zero carbon. Sounds incredibly <coughs> challenging. It was much less challenging in, 19, in 1990, but we chose to fail. So eventually, if you keep choosing to fail, we end up like this. And this is why you can see the negative emissions are there, because we don't like this. So we then come up with a scam to overcome it. But if we're a bit more honest about it, we're in this really difficult position. And this means immediate and profound system-level changes. Let's compare that with the Committee on Climate Change's Net Zero report. That's their budget range for the previous report that they had. Now, their new super ambitious Net Zero report that had lots of academics flying out there saying how marvellous it was, that's the difference between that line and that line. Yeah. Academics should do the maths before they comment. So it's really, really, that doesn't really justify a huge radical shift in our policies in the UK, does it? But that's what you saw in the press, and that's what you saw from academic statements on this. So you play that out relative to what we're playing out, we would say that our budget should be in that range, that's the 3 to 3.8 roughly. So the budgets in the Committee on Climate Change are two to three times bigger than those we think are appropriate for Paris, but much more in line with business as usual. So it's much more attractive. So if you're in a business as usual future and don't really care too much about our children, then, um, then adopt the CCC approach. So um, are there any um, early sort of, and really deep system level changes on the horizon? Can we see any, any chinks in the armour at the moment? And I, I thought about this when I was coming back from Bonn a few years ago. I was really it was quite depressing. I was taking the, the train back up to, up to Sweden and I was I felt quite down after the event, and I, I don't get down generally, but it was really quite a depressing event. And I started to think about it, and I, I wrote a piece that got um, published actually in the end. Um, and then you think about it really, you're a policymaker, uh, scientists, and academics across the board, civil service, journalists, business, and the whole spec, we're all going to have an iron car. Yeah. There, are no, there are no significant signs of hope in that lot. And that's what I was thinking, I was sat on the train, you know. Getting more and more depressed. But as I got nearer to Sweden, I started to pick up a bit because Sweden's a nice place to be. But um, so we are, this is Helen the Handcart picture, some of you might know. You might recognise some of the heads on here. There's um, probably a few I'd like to put in there. Uh, so my, my, I started to question myself uh, as I was heading up towards Denmark actually. So is there light and despair? And perhaps this is me just desperately seeking out some hope. Um, but I don't think so. I thought about this a lot and reflected that am I just desperately searching hope, or do I think there's actually some chance of us doing anything? And my conclusion is, yes, there is. There's everything still to play for. Um, and Leonard Cohen helped with that. So there's always an upbeat man, Leonard Cohen. <laughs> 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 so everyone knows his music. People think, people think just the opposite. Anyway. Um, so there's a crack in everything. Um, and I started thinking, well, what are these cracks? In our, the fabric of the establishment, that's what I'm asking about, is, of which, of course, I'm part. So what are the cracks that are in there? I think the banking crisis is a really good example. I'm not saying these are good or bad. I'm just saying they're cracks, and they're quite big cracks. The banking crisis, you go back to 2006 and suggest that the Chancellor of the Exchequer should write a cheque for half a trillion pounds for the following year. I mean, everyone think you were mad. The following year, he wrote a cheque for half a trillion pounds. No, it was OK. You could argue it was a complete squandering of the money in many respects, and it was pretty much the biggest cheque that's ever been handed from the public purse to the private purse, but some governments like doing that. Um, but it, it could have gone into uh, greening of our infrastructure. We could have actually spent it on civil engineering, on retrofitting our houses, so that people in pure poverty could, could actually have decent um, houses for them and their children. We could have had more affordable public transport. We could have done all sorts of wonderful things with it. We didn't. We chose to squander it. Um, the Chinese and the Koreans did spend a certain amount of their quantity, a reasonable amount of their quantity of eating on greening, but most of the Western countries just didn't bother to do that. They just handed it to the bankers. Social media. Go back... Certainly quite a few of you here well, remember social media when you were a bit younger. Um, you know, it's quite a new phenomenon. Even if you went back to 2005, I think, it'd be hard to imagine where we are now. And perhaps even 2015, it'd be hard to imagine where we are now. How important social media has been. Now, again, you can think for good or ill. Overall, I think it's a really positive thing with some terrible repercussions. But 
what do we have before? We had four rich white men living in the country that owned the newspapers for the last hundred years. You know, that was fake news a lot of the time we've been fed, but we didn't know it because only a handful of people actually owned the newspapers. So we've been reading the same sorts of news by the same sorts of people for 100 years and completely normalised it as if that is news. So at least with social media, you've now got 60 million nutters tweeting. Um, but it does, that means there's some re re responsibility on us as users of social media, as well as other forms of media, to be more discerning. You, can't, you obviously can't just believe what you're writing, what, what you're reading. I would argue you couldn't do that with the previous newspapers either, whatever colour the newspaper might have been. We have to be more discerning users of media more generally. But overall, I think it's great that, that a janitor can argue with a professor about climate change. Yeah, it's the ideas that matter, not your position, as Richard Feynman said many years ago. He's spot on on many things, Richard Feynman. Um, who would have thought Brexit and Trump, Trump could happen? I don't think if you went back seven years, anyone could imagine Trump leaving the US. Would anyone really think very few people thought the UK was going to come out of the European Union? I'm not trying not to make any comment whether these are good or bad things. I'm just saying they are, certainly there are radical shifts in the system. You can argue that Bernie Sanders and to some extent Corbyn are also quite interesting characters to have emerged out of the system and the questioning of the establishment or the gilets jaunes to some extent in, in um, a little bit, maybe less so in France. The Arab Spring, okay, ended up as a disaster, but I think the really interesting sort of emergent people power, perhaps you've seen that in Hong Kong at the moment, um, and social media, of course, playing into that, those there, and to Obama, and again into the Arab Spring to some extent. The plummeting price of renewables, even the renewables industry people didn't think the price of renewables would be what it is today, and it's still going down. And they're okay, we can ask that there are issues of intermittency, I think they're overplayed by some and underplayed by others, but there are, there are certainly important issues there to take into account. But the renewables just keep coming down in price, particularly solar, and even offshore wind, the latest round of offshore wind, if they deliver at the price that the private sector is promising, will be about half of the last big round. So there's no, at the moment, there's no sign those costs are going to mature just in the near future. So look at the prices that are going to keep coming down. And even, sort of, you know, barely a left-wing think tank, the IMF. But even the IMF <laughs> are, are sort of pointing out the sort of health impacts, serious health impacts of fossil fuels, and pointed out that subsidy of fossil fuels in 2015 was about $5.3 trillion if you took the health impacts. And, and there was some climate element, but mostly it was direct subsidy and health impacts. They said the subsidy to fossil fuels from the IMF was $5.3 trillion, far more than any subsidy you ever had seen to renewables. So I think there are, there are plenty of evidence that there are cracks all over the place in the current system. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to solve the problem, but if, if they start then to let a little bit of light through, to think differently about where we are. And so whether it's Greta Thunberg, whether it's the school strikes, um, whether it's Extinction Rebellion, um, you may, you know, whatever your different views of these people are, and what, I can, what is interesting, I think, when you look at this, or indeed the flight, flight shame, or I think more appropriately, if you look at the way it is in Swedish, it's probably more flight conscience than necessarily shame. And that's an important distinction, I think. But what, what's interesting here is that, go back two years, go back 18 months, do we, do we really think a 15-year-old schoolgirl, she's 15 then, she's 16 now, a 15-year-old schoolgirl was going to have more impact in bringing climate change to the fore than the whole academic movement across the world. All of the NGOs, all of the other, other people. And, she's asked, and, 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 and Greta is fully aware that she's no saviour. Greta is fully aware that she's there just catalyzing change, and she's using other people's work to try and bring it to the fore. I mean, she's a sort of conduit, um, of, or a conduit of truth to some extent, because of her medical condition. She, she, she is sort of a very honest, she always, she always has a very honest interpretation of whatever she reads. That's been really helpful. But who would have thought that any of this would have happened? and fundamentally change our dialogue and our discourse on climate change. That doesn't mean say we're going to solve it, because obviously these people aren't going to solve it, but they, are, they have started to shape the foundations for the rest of us, I think, to some extent. So perhaps we all have this role to be new shards of light that may start to point, and maybe can start to come together and point to a different direction. So let's think what this all plays out in terms of real action. What could real action look like from putting all this together? One equation in this, it always, you probably always lose, lose half of your listenership or readership in the equation. So. That's half of dozing off now. Um, but it's not a very complicated equation. Paris plus IPCC, I should say working group one, actually, um, equals equity. Now, you don't have to worry about it from a moral point of view. You, morals, you might be a, um, a sort of nosic philosopher or a Milton Friedman economist, whatever you want to be, even if you're on that end of the spectrum. It's not the morals about this that matter, it's the maths. The maths tell you you have to do this, regardless of our moral or political position. CO2 is massively skewed, and this is virtually never, well, I say virtually, I think it's all, perhaps occasionally it's mentioned, but almost never brought up in the main scenarios that we look at about what we're going to do about climate change. 
it's hugely skewed to a small group of people. So this is the global numbers taken from Chanson and Piketty um, in 2015. Um, and has been replicated by quite a lot of people since. The actual infographic is taken from Oxfam, but the numbers are from the Chanson and Piketty report. And what you see is that most emissions come from a very small group of people. So you cannot squeeze emissions out of people that don't emit. So a bit, a bit of basic maths there, isn't it, really? Um, and the bit that they do emit, because I'm sure someone said, oh, they are emitting something, they're so structurally locked into that that these people actually do not have any agency, do not have really any major choice. That is not true for me and the group up here, the high emitters. But we've got huge agency and choice. We pretend we haven't. These people haven't. We have. 50% of global CO2 comes from 10% um, of the population. 70% of global CO2 comes from about 20% of the population. We're trying to get some funding in Sweden to look at this in country, well, at least for a suite of countries. So in Sweden, I think that curve, that previous one, that one there, would probably be sort of more straight side. It would still come down to a bit narrower at the bottom, but it's probably more like, more like that. The UK is probably like that. The US is probably not even tighter, I don't know. But, so it would be interesting to try and see what different countries are like, and I think probably your policies will have to look different depending on the shape of the curves. But somewhere like the UK is a highly inequitable society, as, the, as is the US. So we, um, I'm pretty sure our curve will look, and some of the early work we've done looks, looks like it's going to be something along those sorts of lines. Um, oh, sorry, I did that one already. So, does this really matter? That's a question you often get. Does it really matter about the few that emit lots of emissions? Well, I'll just do the maths. And uh, this, is a, um, this is a slide I've been using for quite a few years now. Um, I still find a bit of a shock, and I go out, every so often I go out and recheck the maths, and it's just, it's just basic arithmetic and some imperial data. Just imagine that we actually thought climate change was a serious issue, and clearly, collectively, we don't, but let's imagine we did. Um, and let's imagine that we had regulations that forced the top 10% of global emitters two-thirds of whom are in the OECD countries and one-third are in the poor parts of the world, to reduce their emissions to the level of the average European, average EU citizen. So, I mean, average EU citizen lives a reasonable life in the EU. It's not a terrible existence. They manage to get by from day to day quite well. Um, and we, so we forced them to do that. And the other 90% of the global population made no change to their behaviour. If anyone see this slide, you'll know the answer. Does anyone know what the reductions would be? Would there be any reduction if we did that? Just this 10%? A one-third cut in global CO2. So just 10% forced to make, because they're not going to do it forced to make those changes would do that. Now, if, it's, if we're in a climate emergency, then clearly you'd go ahead and do this. This is what we did in the Second World War with rationing of food and petrol. So if it's an emergency, you can do this in a, in a week, certainly in a few months, and without a doubt, within a year. It wouldn't solve climate change, but given that all, of the, all the pledges we made for Paris were no reduction by 2030, that's a quite good start. So we have to do lots more than that. But we're not even prepared to countenance that. It's not in any scenario that's out there. And I think that leads you to two unavoidable sort of components of a strategy. It doesn't tell you what the policies look like. The policies are very culturally specific. Now, some, it depends on your economy, your culture, a whole set of structures to do with your geography and everything else. So the policies, the particular policies will change from country to country. They'll be different from Sweden to China, from China to the US, from the US to the UK. We'd all choose different sets of policies. But the overall strategy will look, I have three phases to it. You, first, you've got to come off the curve. Yeah, remember what I said before, 30% reduction in three years. So you can't do that with, let's swap out all of our infrastructure for some new bits of technology. You're not going to do that in three years. Even with a Marshall-style plan, you can do that. So the first thing you've got to do is have legislation that brings about profound changes by the high emitters in our society. And we know who they are. And we know how to tailor policies towards them. The problem is that we are the ones that have to tailor policies towards us. That's the big problem there. It's the chickens having to, sorry, the boxes having to guard the chicken coop. Um, in the near term, we've got to have very, very stringent efficiency standards on everything. An A rated free refrigerator uses about um, 60 to 80 percent more energy than an A refrigerator for the same size. So let's make standards on all of these things and you tighten them every single year. So the financial directors will squeal, but the engineers will broadly deliver on it. And actually, refrigerators, cars, electrical equipment, everything, in industry and elsewhere. So you, you, you really tighten down the efficiency. Um, and you can't sell unless you meet that standard every year. And of course, you have got the rebound effect, you have this rebound effect, so when people will then start to, any money they save, they'll spend on something else, like a jet ski or another holiday. So you've got to deal with that, but that's not insurmountable. There are plenty of policy options for dealing with that. 
So that's an important part of it. And of course, we need to make a complete shift in our energy supply system. So I've called it a Marshall style um, reconstruction of the energy supply system. And that will require lots of electrification. Currently, final energy demand in the UK is 20% electricity. 80% of our energy is not electricity. And it's very hard to imagine having energy systems that are zero carbon, that are not electrically uh, oriented one way or another. Even if you have something like hydrogen, it probably comes from electrolysis. There are some other ways around it, but most of it would have to be electricity. So probably I think 80% of our energy would have to come from electricity. It might even be higher. And that's true for country after country. Virtually all countries in the world are around about 20%. Uh, Sweden and um, France with more nuclear and more hydro as well in, in Sweden and indeed in Norway are 30%. But still 70% of the energy is not electricity. And what's important here, I think, and this is not a political comment, but at the moment, the huge number of labour and resources are going into furnishing the relative luxuries of this particular group here. And we cannot solve this one almost overnight unless we take those labour and resources and they start to do that. And that is really challenging politically. But there's no other neat way around that. If a huge proportion of our apprentice engineers and our, you know, other, other people involved are doing these sorts of things and not doing this, then we're going to fail on climate change. So it is a bit like the Second World War when Roosevelt goes into the car companies and says, you know, you're, you're going to have to make some tanks and some planes. We don't want tanks and planes now, but anyway. You know, chums and wind turbine planes. They say, well, you don't understand we're making cars. And he says, no, you don't understand. You won't be making cars. It's that sort of productive shift in our society if we were serious about Paris. And we should have done it earlier. We haven't. We're, so we're stuck with this. So there's this massive shift in labour. And it has lots of job opportunities and all those other wonderful things, which you can, you can write a win-win for quite a few people in society, but not for the people that live in that top group, of course, which includes me, and I would guess quite a few of you here. Just the flavour of what that looks like. Yeah, we're talking about you know, no more large houses, no more building large houses. We're not cycling in Cheshire looking at the huge mansions that vice chancellors and other people are living in. Um, you know, we're no more of those sorts of things. They would have to be split up into flats or you know, appropriate sized houses for, for families. Otherwise, you have to build more houses for other people. It takes lots more materials, lots more labour, lots more carbon emissions. When that labour and materials and carbon emissions should be associated with greening our infrastructure, not building more large houses. No more holiday homes, no more second homes. That's really problematic in Sweden, especially everyone's got a second home. No more prestige cars, SUVs, multiple car ownership, no highly mobile lives. We can travel, we have to go slower and go less often. We can sort of go as far, but it'll take us longer. No more frequent flyer, no business or first class flights, or indeed on trains, because they take up two to three times the amount of emissions. And no more high levels of consumer goods. Because all the labour that's provided in those things need to go into doing this. Now, this is not a socialist argument. You can make it a socialist argument if you want. This is an argument from the maths. If you can find a way around it, other than negative emissions, I'm only too happy to hear, from, hear about it. And all this has to be done in about 20 years. So we you know, all we found on Paris, that's another thing. We get perfectly reasonable to say we're going to fail on Paris, as long as we tell our children and our grandchildren, honestly, at breakfast, we're going to fail their futures. That's a reasonable thing to do. That's an honest thing to do. But uh, let's not pretend and massage it like we have done for years. We need new narratives. We have to rethink the structure of our society because we've chosen to fail. But what does growth mean? Is it growth in GDP or growth in female literacy? Which is, which is more important? What's progress? What's development? How do we reframe what's important in our lives? If that's most of you here, what do you value most? It won't be something you probably most value on. It'll be your children or your friendships or your, you know, what, something, it'll be something else that you value, not something that we put a price on. So let's start to recognize the most important things in our societies do not have prices. And the last thing we want is economists or astrologists to put prices on them. Um, and what do we do about rewarding success? When you think about that, you know, if you're a professor, you get paid a lot more than a postdoc. So my emissions will be much higher. I have a bigger house, fly more often, have a bigger car. You know, the whole thing about our success structure is how can you maximise your fuel, your carbon footprint? Students come to university to get a better education, so they get a better job, so they have a bigger car, a bigger house. I mean, the whole this system is set up like that. We're going to have to rethink how do you reward success? Are there other ways of doing that? Because we cannot technically get our way out of the problem in the short term. We need a different relationship towards time. Like some other cultures have talked about seven generations in the past and seven generations in the future. We now think about half an hour in the future. So we need to start to think differently about time in this. And I think we have to sort of embed much deeper into intergenerational equity and a much deeper appreciation of the more than human world, of which, of course, we are part, and we're trying to abstract, us, abstract ourselves from it since the Enlightenment and failed abysmally. I mean, there were lots of wonderful things that have come out of industrialization and post-Enlightenment. But, but now we're at a point where we're not to be able to deal with the system-level implications, and we have to rethink our, our role in that. So to conclude, 
climate change has become system change, simply because we've left it so late. There's no, I can see no neat way out of that, unless you either want to become a sceptic or believe in negative emissions in the future. As Einstein noted, and he didn't, well, we don't know if he did or not, but it's attributed to him, um, which is a good expression anyway. Um, <laughs> insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And when it comes to climate change, thus far we've chosen to pass onto our own children the consequences of 30 years of such insanity. And, and, as, as I, and right at this moment, I see no direct evidence that my generation have any intention to do anything else other than carrying on with insanity. Thankfully, the next generation are kicking us a bit now, and so maybe we will change quite rapidly. Perhaps in 2019, we are changing. So going back to the quote, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. And we can all be shards of light in one way or another. And that maybe the, there's an emergent outcome from that, which means that, means that we can actually rapidly see system change along the lines of a sort of prosperous, low carbon, and more equitable future. So, on that note, thank you very much for listening. Okay, um, so I feel both uh, chastened and uh, impassioned, I think, <laughs> after that. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we've got uh, about 10 minutes or so for some questions. There are some roaming mics uh, along the sides. So if anyone would like to ask Kevin a question... Oh, right, uh, okay. Uh, I saw your hand up first. You just wait for the microphone to come down from uh, the side here, please. Anyone on this side of the... First of all, thank you very much indeed. It was inspiring. Thank you. And um, what worries me is everybody is trying to put a positive spin on yeah. it because if, they, if the population knew the reality, they'd say we've blown it anyway. But given what's been happening in California, Brazil, Siberian methane fields, isn't there actually a serious chance that we have blown it? Uh, yes, there's, there is undoubtedly a serious chance that we've blown it, but we don't know that for certain. And, and actually, what do you mean by blown it? Uh, I mean, it looks like we've... I think we're really struggle to stay to two degrees centigrade, but if we pull out all stops and we're a little bit lucky on the climate sensitivity, then we might have still hold for two degrees centigrade. But even if we don't, 2.1 is better than 2.3, and 2.3 is better than 2.5. So it, everything is still to play for, and the, the scientific uncertainty here actually is in our favour from a sort of political point of view, because we might be lucky on climate sensitivity. But if we don't act now, and uh, we have to act now in the way I'm sort of laying out here, and be lucky on climate sensitivity, then I think two degrees centigrade is still viable. But if we act now and we're unlucky on climate sensitivity, we'll see a higher temperature, but it'd still be much better than if we chose to do nothing. So everything is still to play for on this. But you are right, in, in the, you know, the prospects are not good, but we have some agency in, in how bad they'll be. Thanks. Another question here, if, if there's anyone over there, then uh, do you want to just move up? Two comments for you to respond to. First, more than 50 years ago, my sixth form dissertation was entitled Population, Pollution, and Exhaustion of Natural Resources, mm. Their Psychological Causes and Political Consequences. In other words, the key words were denial and inaction. Unfortunately, the title was the best part. However, um, <laughs> population pollution and exhaustion of natural resources interact. So fortunately, the demographic transition in Europe and the Far East is now appearing elsewhere, including at least two parts of Africa. So it is, given circumstances, species-specific, not culture-specific. When people live long enough they will, they will experience a second transition. They will realize that après nous le déluge means the deluge is coming for them. Second comment. For slow-mo renewable energy generation, such as windmills, etc., we need uh, transition elements with a very high magnetic potential and they're in short supply. 
unless we track rainforests and murder the inhabitants or risk destroying the oceans, we may have to go to the moon and asteroids. Um, whatever course we take, it may be that the key will be beating militaristic swords into renewable long-term plowshares. Please comment. <laughs> I think, I think, probably I don't disagree with a lot of what you had to say there. Um, I think the technology and the second part on the, on the, on the issues to do with intermittency and, the, and the, um, the types of materials we need, that is, that is a huge challenge that I think we'll be able to come, overcome technically, that one. Um, in terms of the other ones, I think I'd broadly accept the comments that you're making. They're, they're a useful <laughs> backdrop to some of the things that we need to look at, particularly in terms of sustainability. I would argue probably slightly more in terms of sustainability than climate change. I think climate change is more... It's a, it's a much simpler issue to address than sustainability, and I think your concerns play out more for sustainability than they do for climate change. Climate change is one simple element, relatively simple, and we're still struggling with that, of, 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 of a sustainability agenda. The problem with it is it's, it's got more of a time footprint on it than, than the rest of the issues on sustainability. Thanks. Uh, question back, I'll come to you as well. Oh, thank you. Um, after hearing your um, strategy for how to deliver on the Paris Agreement. I'm wondering what the act, a realistic step could be towards, take, towards um, addressing that. Um, it seems like it would be regulation, but at the international level, since the Paris Agreement has subjected everything towards um, national willpower, it doesn't seem realistic that any state is going to increase its ambition, especially when it's not universal and reciprocal. So I don't know whether you think the first step would be an academic response or policy at the domestic level, law at the international level. Yeah. I think what you raise is absolutely key. Some of my colleagues repeatedly say you have to have some international framework to drive nations. I think if you wait for that, my judgment, I could be completely wrong on this, my judgment is I think if you wait for that, we will fail. I think what we're going to have to have, as we often see with individuals, you'll see individuals you'll step up and make you know, and, and, and be the example. And I think that's what we're going to have to have with some nations. In the UK, um, indeed Sweden, and well, less Norway, it's more than sort of like the Qatar of Scandinavia. Um, but Sweden and the UK could be two countries who could actually step up and, and, and drive an agenda, sitting in the rugby <laughs> parts of the world, prepared to forgo some, for instance, I've been pointing out here, you know, a moratorium on fossil fuel development. Um, you know, the whole suite of things here, the sorts of things we'd have to do. And actually, I've heard some discussions within politics in the UK, across the parties, but particularly within the Greens and the Labour Party, um, for these sorts of scale of challenges that we're prepared to meet these. And I think it wouldn't take many countries to start to see um, sort of an example that others would start to follow. And this is one of the reasons, if, uh, I'm putting my colours on the math here, um, why I don't like Brexit is actually I think the EU is sufficiently large trading bloc to actually drive a global agenda, whilst any a member state of the EU is not. And I think if the EU goes in the EU, it could be part of a really, really progressive driving force for climate change in the EU. So there are lots of MEPs and other countries that are deeply interested in these issues. But to go along as a country is quite difficult. But to go along within the EU, I think, would be much, much more viable. And it'd be hard for any other part of the world to ignore it, because about one third of the world trade goes through it. So it's one of the reasons I think that we should, that, that you had a really important role within, within the EU. But it, it will require some people to step forward and demonstrate examples. And that could be in our university to start off with, and then it could be within our schools or our hospitals, and then eventually some, some of the areas, the, you know, the geographies, the councils might be there in our countries. And so it could be that that drives the, the national government. So in that sense, we all have that chance to be that, that sort of um, that catalyst for change. Uh, thank you very much. I thought it was a great talk. Um, you just touched on uh, part of the question I would ask, and that's just about the current election and, uh, and what I think about the noises that are being made by the different parties, and in particular uh, the Green New Deal. Um, I, 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 should just, just, should, I should be clear about this. I've engaged a lot with Labour Party over the last two years in this. I have previously engaged with lots of other political parties, but the Labour Party had a sustainable um, economics committee. Um, which we look at this in a lot of detail with Clive Lewis and a number of other MPs. Um, and actually, they are sort of talking about these sorts of scales of challenges, and, and I think that they've been quite genuine about it. I've not heard that dialogue from within the other parties, I mean, the Green Party at the moment, um, and, and of course, Carl Lewis is excellent on all these issues. 
But that's not to say that there aren't people in other parties that are really deeply involved or, or would like to drive their party agenda in that way. But I don't think that there's any 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 sort of ministerial presence yet that, that's involved with this at all. So at the moment, um, it's hard not to be to look at bleed neutral. To me, it looks very clear as to which parties will drive will will have the, the courage to drive this sort of agenda. Um, and you can make your judgment as to which ones I might think they would be. But that's not to say there aren't some really good individuals in the other parties who would perhaps get on board with these things. So, it's, so ultimately, it's a bit like Brexit. In the end, making these sort of changes is not necessarily a party political issue or party issue. But at the moment, the parties that are leading, that have, have already thought about it, I think are Labour and the Greens. Thanks. Okay, my question is about the books that you showed early on in your presentation. Now, I write to politicians and decision makers from time to time about climate-related issues, and I generally quote from the Stern Review. Now, are you suggesting that I ought to get something else to quote? <laughs> what would this book be? Yeah. I think it's a great quote from Stern Review, as long as not using numbers. <laughs> actually, I think he was very brave on discounting. I think and that's a hugely important issue. Let's underplay that issue. Discounting is about how you plan in the future, and they, a lot of economists use that, and they can always say that it's better to wait for something else in the future. That's why negative emissions are so popular, because you apply discount rate, which means actually they're always free in the future, and that's always cheaper than doing something today. And Stern questioned that, and he deserves significant credit for it. But I think if you're talking about the scale of the change that he's requiring in Stern Review, which is quite old now, 2006, so it's 13 years old, I, I do think he completely underplays the scale of the, the problem. And I can say from privately talking to him only a couple of times but over a you know, glass of wine and a pint of ale, and, and indeed many other people, but they, they, most people I engage with don't disagree with what, really what I'm saying here, only when you put a microphone in front of them. Because <laughs> the belief is, and, I, and it's a very, often very good people, but I think there's a deep-seated arrogance in this, so really good people, well-meaning, um, but what they're doing is think, thinking that I can make a good interpretation, assess, assess what the political repercussions of this would be, and therefore I have to tailor my messages to make it politically more acceptable. And I think that simply is wrong for us as experts and academics to ever do that. Um, because we are not experts in political economy, we're experts wherever that field might be. And therefore it's, it, our role in society is to be brutally honest, do our work carefully, and recognise we're involved occasionally and change it, but then be brutally honest with our conclusions. And, and I think there's a very well-meaning academics have repeatedly been very arrogant about climate change, their climate change repercussions for probably 10 or 20 years. And you know, at the risk of, I don't want to pick on Stern, but I think Stern is one of the, those ones who says publicly something that he doesn't believe in privately. Thanks. We're, we're running close on time, so I've not, not got much left, but perhaps a uh, question there and then a final one over here. Thanks, Kevin. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, how do you think your lecture should inform universities that are trying to uh, formulate travel policies, particularly towards flying? And how, what would you say to senior academics, some of whom working on climate change, who are arguing for continued flying? We're in the 21st century. We know what the maths tells us and our science tells us. We have social media, we have open access journals, and we've got all sorts of virtual communication. So let's start to address the problem with the tools available to us in the 21st century. A lot of people are arguing for this almost like back to the last century, the last, say 1980 to 2010 sort of approach. We're in a different place now. We have different tools at our disposal. You don't have to fly to become internationally renowned. We like it, we enjoy some of the, the camaraderie that comes with meeting our colleagues around the world. But actually, do we really gain hugely from it? We always argue we do. Yet I talk to my academics in, in Manchester, and it's really important for cultural exchange. So I was saying, well, how often do you visit Cheetham Hill, which is about 10 kilometers north of the university? You never find an academic there. Completely different culture in Cheetham Hill. So we're not flying around the world to meet other people like us in airports. And you know, I like the airport you set off from. So the only cultural exchange you get is with a taxi driver or someone that serves us in one of the hotels. Um, but let's be a bit more honest about this. You know, we, we will have to start to address these questions much more seriously. We do not require to fly around the world to engage um, on uh, interacting with our ideas. I also think things like field work, which is more problematic, but with field work, people have been doing field work for years. Darwin never flew as far as I'm aware. So you've got a lot of field work. Um, and and, and, and you know, many scientists have, so therefore we have to start thinking, how do you do field work differently? 
Well, I'm doing it in this little two weeks, two weeks since you fly out and you can fly back. How about going out there for four months or six months? We have to reschedule, have to restructure our life. Same with students. Should the students come in for three years? Or should they come in for maybe two years and it's more, more intense so they only go home once during that time? I'm not saying these are the right or the wrong answers. They're saying we have to think of doing these things very differently to how we, have, how we have done them historically. And this is primarily a problem for my generation. I think the younger generation are more on board with this. Then, uh, not all of them, I'm upset, you know, but uh, I think more, more on board with this. But it is incumbent on my generation to not keep telling the early career researchers that they've got to build an international career by physically going around the world. You know, we can engage internationally, virtually now, it's all you know, it gets a tick on your CV. So there are, there are plenty of ways it should be, should be leading by example. And just to top that off, the evidence is from the psychologists that have worked on these issues for years, there's repeated evidence that if you want your message to be taken seriously, then the credibility of that message is improved if our behaviour is broadly aligned with it. I mean, it's bloody obvious, anyway. And it's something that's worked out for years. And now, so there are, there's plenty of empirical evidence to support that. And therefore, if you want our, our, our arguments to be taken seriously, let's try and run our institutions and structures in broadly in alignment with them. So that sounds like a question you've been asked before, Kevin. It's, uh, <laughs> um, so final, final question to one of our own climate conscious. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, it, it may amuse you to know that many of these here were listening to Lord Stern in this very auditorium a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> just, just out for your interest. Um, your uh, analysis uh, seems so uh, far off track uh, from the what I might call the orthodox sort of scientific, I mean, Committee on Climate Change type yeah. of messages. I mean, do they hate you or just do they don't speak to you anymore? <laughs> well, certainly my direct messages on Twitter, I've got a lot of engagements with uh, Chris Stark, we have a lot of time and respect for. And I've spoken at the CCC on a number of occasions, and indeed at, at the old Department for Energy and Climate Change with David Mackay, who I've gotten very well with. Um, no, I, I mean, I don't want to say what they tell me privately, but um, they're very happy with me doing what I'm doing and saying what I'm saying. It's really challenging for them, but it does mean that they, I mean, they, they don't really disagree with my analysis. I mean, there's, there's nuanced differences here and there, but they don't really disagree with it. Um, but, and, and they know that by, by me saying the things that I'm saying, that gives them slightly more leverage to push harder as well. So it is helpful for them. I still think that is problematic to see it like that. I think the CCC, guided by the commissioners, by the academic commissioners, should be doing much more scientifically robust work. Just on the CCC, just worth noting that when they went from the 80% report to the 1.5 net zero report, the principal thing they did was to turn the negative emissions button up by 40%. And not an academic bothered to speak out about it. 40% increase in negative emissions. And the academic community just stayed quiet. Well, at least most of them said how wonderful the report was. I might say I found your presentation to totally compelling and convincing. Oh, and I'm sure most people here did as well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>